Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. I have just a few announcements I need to get off. I know we'll have announcements at the end, but uh, first, we really need your help. We need teachers for our downstairs uh, youth education program. If you're willing to do that, we need that for the summer quarter. And if you're willing to do that, please let Rebecca know uh, or let Michelle or I know they're in the office. Uh, I'll just go ahead and thank you ahead of time for uh, your volunteering to do that. That's an, If you haven't noticed, we have a lot of kids. If you haven't noticed, we have a lot of little kids and a lot of babies and more on the way. I think four this year, maybe more than that. Um, and let, I, I, let me just say one other thing, okay? Moms, dads, do not ever feel bad about your little ones crying. It is music to my ears when I hear babies crying in church, okay? Because that means there's life. That means there's a future. And I guarantee you, this is the best place for them to be. And it's the best place for you to be with them, okay? So don't ever feel bad about that. I want to make sure you throw that. And, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're bothered by little ones, we got some earphone things back there you can put on, and uh, it'll just drown them all out, and you won't have to worry about it. But for the rest of us, we love to hear that. So um, if your baby's crying, don't sweat it. Um, I'm hard of hearing, so I don't hear them anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, also today, um, we are having potluck right after our services this morning. It kind of coincides with the end of this year's 226 before we start again. Uh, 226 is a youth program we have going here that teaches leadership for our boys and girls. Uh, we're going to give them some awards today. Uh, so right after potluck, we're going to come back in here, have a quick Devo, and then do that. Also, if you're here for potluck, you are in, you're in for a treat because Steve Finney brought his award-winning jambalaya today. And so I know you're going to just race back there to get in line to get a bowl to get that jambalaya first. Uh, I was paid to say that. Um, so... <laughs> Just so you know, I have not tasted it. I don't know anything about it. I've got the IOU. Anyway, this morning, all right, I think that's all I was supposed to cover. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that note aside. Um, this morning, we're going to start a brand new series. Um, and I'm excited about it. Uh, there's flyers out there in the back. I, I made some more. You took them all last week, but there's more out there if you want to take them to your friends. And I'm basically just calling it Reclaiming Your Inner Peace. And again, like I said last week, this is not a Zen yoga class. We're not going to sit around and chant mantras or anything like that. Um, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, okay? Um, I kind of want to look at some things that keep us from having that sense of peace, that sense of calm, that sense of assurance in our lives. And, and, and I don't have to tell you, over the last three, four years, there's been enough happening in the world, enough happening around us that robs us of our inner peace. We feel uneasy, we feel restless, we feel fearful. fearful. We're, we're ridden with, with stress, with anxiety. But do we have to be? Do we have to be? I think the Bible will tell us that we don't. We don't have to live like that. So over the course of the next five or six weeks, we're going to be diving into some specific areas of life that, that will keep us from being at peace with ourselves, with, with others, and, and most importantly, being at peace with our Heavenly Father. The, the first area I want to tackle today is simply this. It's this idea of failure. Now, I don't know about you, but, but failure is something that we all deal with, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. When, when, you know, what, what do you do when you have plans that don't go the way you want them to? Anybody ever been there? Yeah. When your investments tank, when, when you get fired from your job or, or your job ceases and you no longer have an income, when, when your marriage falls apart or, or when, you, when you feel like you've just completely and utterly failed as a parent and your kids aren't doing or, or going in the direction that you want them to go and there's that automatic feel, feel, feeling of, of just abject failure. What did I do wrong? Anybody ever ask that question of yourself? What did I do wrong? How, how did it go south so fast? 
Well, before we dive into it, I, I want to give you three just absolute facts. These are axioms that, that are true no matter what, and, and you're going to look at them and you're going to go, duh, I knew that, okay? But, but the problem is sometimes they're, they're so real and they're so apparent that we don't see them when we're in the middle of whatever it is we're going through. And the first is simply this, failure is painful. It hurts, okay? Um, it hurts. And when you fail, it will leave a scar, Damage will be done. Your ego gets wiped completely clean. Your confidence is gone. Your pride is gone. It's replaced with embarrassment. And again, the pain, it hurts. It hurts emotionally. It hurts relationally. It hurts spiritually. And it even hurts physically. And some of you right now are dealing with the pain and the scars that have been left over from past failures. That's real. And you need to understand it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And, and the second axiom that goes along with that is, is almost just as apparent, and it's this. Failure is universal. It happens to everybody. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm the only one who's ever failed, guess what? You're wrong. Everybody has. Everybody's, everybody's tried and failed. Everybody's tried their best and failed. Every, it happens to, how many of y'all watch the matrix? How many of y'all seen the matrix? Put your hands down. You shouldn't be watching that kind of stuff. <laughs> gotcha. No, I've seen it. <laughs> the, the, there's a really cool, yeah, I'm not even going to try to explain the matrix. All right. But there is a scene in the matrix where Neo, who's kind of the, the hero of the thing, he's trying to learn how to jump inside the matrix, right? And the matrix is this kind of computer. I won't go there. Anyway, he's trying to learn how to jump because in the matrix, you can jump like from building to building. You can jump huge money. And, and so he's standing, he's about to jump from one building to an X and they're all watching and they're all going, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? And then the one guy in the back, the realist in the back, nobody makes it on the first time. Everybody fails. And guess what? He does all the way to the bottom crashes. Even though he was the one. Failure is universal. And let me tell you something. If you're looking around and you see some people sitting on the pews next to you, and, and man, they're, 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 their tie is straight and their coat is pressed and there's no wrinkles in their shirt. And you, yeah, Paul, get, get it all right there, buddy. Okay. Um, right. And, and you look around and, and, you, and you start thinking, oh man, they're perfect. Guess what? They're not. They're not. We've all failed. We've all messed up. We've all had issues. Failure is universal. It happens to us all. And the third is simply this. Failure either results in paralysis or it results in growth. Let's talk about paralysis first. I know there's some who refuse to try something new because they've tried it before and failed. It didn't go like they wanted it to go. They didn't get the applause they wanted. They didn't feel good. They failed. They got hurt. I don't know. They tried it. They failed. And guess what? They ain't doing it again. Not going there again. Why? Because failure is painful. I don't want to remember that failure. And so what happens is we get paralyzed. We get stuck. And we're unwilling to move or act because we have failed. It causes paralysis. Or, or it either does that or it causes growth. In other words, I learn from my mistake, I learn from what I did wrong, and then I decide next time I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to do it differently next time. So we either get stuck or we grow. Now let me ask you this. Which do you think Jesus would have us do? Grow, right? Exactly. Listen, failure happens to everyone, but what you do with that failure can be the greatest difference in your life. How you deal with it can make all the difference. Okay. This morning, we're going to take a look at an episode in the life of Peter. Okay. And, and no, it's not when he sank, when he was walking on water and it's not when he failed not to deny Jesus before his death. But, but that's what makes Peter so great for us to look at because he was one of the greatest followers of Jesus. He was an apostle. He was a leader in the church and yet his life is marred with failure. And so there's a lot we can learn. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter 5 this morning. Let's read the first seven verses together. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, this is Jesus, 
to hear the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled, filled both the boats, so they began to sink. What do we learn from this? What does this teach us about failure? Because there's some important truths in it that, that we need to pull from it. Jesus never performs a miracle without a purpose. He, he always has a reason for doing what he does. And, and, and he wants to teach us, I think, a valuable lesson. And this miracle teaches us what to do sometimes when our best simply isn't good enough. Okay? Now, we've all experienced failure because we didn't do our best, right? I mean, um, you didn't study for the test, and so you bombed it. Or uh, you didn't follow the instructions, so whatever you were putting together didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. We, we, we get that. We understand when we don't do our best, sometimes we fail. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about when you do your absolute best and you still fail. When you study week after week after week after week and you make the C- minus or the F. When you try and you try and you try and you try to save your marriage and it still falls apart. When you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray for your kids and they're still unfaithful. You understand what I'm talking about? When you do everything you think possible to do and it's still not good enough. The failure still comes. What do we do? The interesting thing about this story is the comparison between these two catches. You see, the disciples had worked hard all night. We'll assume doing the very best they knew how to do. They're professional fishermen. And yet they caught nothing. Then they go out again. And for what sounds like a 10 or 15 minute fishing trip, they catch more fish than they've ever caught before in their life. What was the difference? Same water, same boat, same nets, same people. What made the difference between the two? There's actually three we're going to look at this morning between these two fishing expeditions. And the differences will give us some guidelines, I think, to follow when our best attempts even end in failure. And if you will apply these principles sincerely and honestly and faithfully, I will guarantee you will be successful. And I don't say that often. Okay? I don't like to make guarantees. But if God words guarantees it, then I'm comfortable with backing that up. Okay? But before we do that, there's something we have to get clear. All right? And I think, I think in our culture today, we really need to hear this. And it's simply this. God is interested in your success. God wants you to be successful. Now, when I say successful, I'm not talking about rich. Okay, but God is interested in you being successful on your job. He's interested in you being successful as a spouse. He's interested in you being successful as a parent. He wants you to succeed just like any parent in their right mind wants their children to succeed. They want the very best for them. Guess what? God wants the very, very best for you too. Do we believe that? Okay. We need, to, we need to get that down before we jump into this. The first principle I think we get from this is simply this. Get Jesus in your boat. Okay? I know that sounds, that sounds simple. What I'm really saying is this. Appropriate God's presence in your life. Appropriate his presence in your life. Go where Jesus is. Jesus' presence in Peter's boat made all the difference. This time, these guys weren't fishing by themselves. Jesus was in the boat. Too many times in my own life, I've got to tell you, too many times, I, I've tried to fish without God. I've gone off by myself, in my own power, in my own plans, in my own wisdom. 
And usually it was because I was convinced in my own mind that I was doing exactly what I needed to do, only to watch that idea or that plan fall completely apart. Why? Because it was all based on me. It was all based on my ability. It was based on what I thought, what I saw, what I needed. I wanted God to go where I wanted to go instead of me going where God was. Too many times we make plans and then we invite God's blessing. Instead of seeking what God wants us to do and then joining God in his work, we, we run headlong down the road and we go, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I think. This is what we need to do. And we think, oh, yeah, that's perfect. God, come along beside me and, and bless this. And God's the last person we go to instead of the first person we go to. We want to appropriate God's presence into our lives instead of us appropriating ourselves into his presence. Coming before him. Riley really appreciated your prayer this morning, brother. Think about it. Whose idea was it for Jesus to get into the boat? Was it Peter's? No, it was Jesus' idea. It was Jesus' plan. But when you follow Jesus, you have to give him total access to your entire life. For Peter, his boat represented his livelihood. When you're a fisherman, your boat is your business. And it's significant that, that, that Peter made his boat available to Jesus. Jesus used Peter's business, if you will, as a platform for his ministry. And Peter gave God total access to any and every area of his life in that act. He's saying, yes, take my business, take my source of income, take who I am, my identity, take it all and use it how you will. And Jesus did. Let me ask you, how about your life? Do you invite Jesus into every possible area of it? Or do you, do you simply compartmentalize him into the areas that are religious? Does he get Sundays? But Monday through Saturday, you do what you want. I mean, yeah, he's in here, but, but is, he on, is, he, is he with you right now as you're looking at your phone or playing the game or doing whatever you're doing instead of, instead of engaging in here? That's what's so easy to do. Is he a part of all access areas of your life? Is he with you on social media? Is he with you on Friday night at your social events? Is he with you at your kid's football game or basketball game or other kind of game? Is he in every area of your life? What about your family, your marriage, your school, your hobbies, your job? When Peter made Jesus his fishing partner, the results were incredible. He caught more fish than he'd ever caught before on his own. But don't miss the sequence, the order, because the order is important. First, Peter used his boat for Christ's purpose. He used what he had in his life for Christ's purpose. Then Jesus used that resource for his purpose and took care of Peter's needs. Sounds a lot like what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Get it, what, sorry. Seek first the kingdom of God. Right? Seek first. Appropriate God's presence first into your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what happens? God takes care of you. And all these things will be added to you. Does that mean if I submit all areas of my life to God and give God access to all areas of my life, that he will take care of me? Yes, that's exactly what that means. That's exactly what that means. I, I'm not speaking outside of the text here. Jesus says, seek him first and what? All these things will be added. Everything you need will be taken care of when you seek the kingdom of God first. The problem is we sit back and we go, well, God's not taking care of me. You know what? I know why. You're not seeking the kingdom first. You're seeking the kingdom also. And there's a huge difference between seeking the kingdom also and seeking the kingdom first. You can also seek the kingdom on Sundays and you can get dressed up and you can come in here and you can choke back some cracker and you can take a swig of grape juice, sing some songs, say some prayers and walk out of here and have appropriated the kingdom also. But you haven't appropriated it first in your life until it impacts you 24-7, 365 days a year in every single thought and decision you make. That's seeking the kingdom first. 
Peter did that when he invited Jesus into his boat, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. The second thing we see, after you appropriate Jesus' presence into your life, then you also have to go with God's plan. Okay? Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So Jesus finishes his, his, his sermon or his teaching there, and he makes a request to Peter. And, and he says, okay, look, let's go drop the nets down, Peter. Now, don't forget what these guys had been doing all night. What had they been doing all night long? Fishing, right? And Jesus comes along and says, hey, let's go fishing, right? That would be like me going to Tyler, right? After he's fished a tournament all weekend long, and he's got his boat, and he's cleaned up his boat, and he's put all his tackle away, and he's just pulled back into the driveway, and, and he's getting ready to walk in the house, and I show up and go, hey, Tyler, let's go fishing, which Tyler would jump in the car and just go. <laughs> He'd be like, let's go, man. I'm, I'm good, wouldn't you? He would, right? But, but here's the thing. Here, here, here's the thing. Jesus comes along and says, hey, let's go. They had just, matter of fact, the text says they were washing their nets. They were putting their stuff up. They were done. Listen, this kind of fishing wasn't just like putting a worm on a hook and throwing a bobbler out there and watching it bounce around the lake, okay? This is hard work. These are big, heavy nets that get thrown off of a boat, and they have to be hauled in. We're talking about a group of experienced sailors. And Jesus comes along and says, hey, guys, let's go fishing. And I, guess what? I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. How many of y'all watch Deadliest Catch? Oh, I love Deadliest Catch. Love that show. How many of y'all know who Sig Hansen is? Sig Hansen is like the, the, he's like the pinnacle of crab fishermen up there. I mean, he's like, he's the man, Right. He knows how to find crab. But now picture this. For those of you who haven't watched it, you can't relate. But he's got this humongous crab boat. He fishes the Bering Sea in the most worst time of the year in storms. It's cold. All this stuff is going on. And he knows exactly where to go to drop these, these big cages down to the bottom of the ocean. So these little crabs, will, well, not little, they're huge crab, will actually you know, crawl in there and he makes all kinds of money. This, now, this, this story would be like me flying to Alaska. Me flying to Alaska getting off the plane, walking down the, down, down the, the, what's that thing called? A dock? I don't know. It's bigger than a dock. What? Oh, a pier. We'll go with pier. Walking down wherever the boat's tied up. You can tell how much of a nautical man I am. I ain't no Navy guy, right? I'm Air Force all the way. We fly. We don't sail. Okay. But, but my, my point is this. It'd be like me walking down the pier, getting on board Sig Hansen's boat, going all the way up to the captain's place and going, Hey Sig, I'm going to tell you where to go fish. How do you think he'd respond? He'd probably throw me off his boat. He's going to take his multi-million dollar boat out there and let some guy who doesn't know anything. Let me ask you this. What was Jesus' occupation? A carpenter. What was Peter's occupation? Fisherman. The carpenter's telling the fisherman how to fish. Think about that. I mean, put it into perspective here. Now, I say all that to say, understand, sometime God asks you to do some things that are going to be hard and that don't make sense to us. And they might make us very uncomfortable. And if you're in the middle of something God has asked you to do that doesn't make sense, just remember this, okay? Remember this. If I get a turn. Obedience to God supersedes understanding God. Let me say it again. Obedience to God supersedes understanding God. And we live in a culture who can't grasp this. Oh, I got to understand everything. I got to understand the why. One of the very first words your child learns to say is what? Why? Do this. Why? I need you to do this. Why? I need you, why? And let me ask you this, parents. What's your first response when your kid says Why? Because I said so. Let me tell you something, church. We as people need to get back into the business of obeying God simply because he said so. Okay? We don't have to understand it all. We don't have to know all the theological implications. We don't have to understand everything around it. But if God said to do it, we need to do it. Period. It's that simple. Peter's response, obey him. 
which is crazy. Peter could have said, whoa, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm the fisherman. This is what I do. What do you want me to do again? Oh, that's right, you're the carpenter, so why don't you just stick to making wood stuff and leave the fish into me? But Peter didn't say that. Instead, Peter says this in verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. How many times do we argue with God's plans? How many times do we argue with God's word? God comes along and says, this is what I want you to do. And we hear it and we read it and we understand it. And yet we come back with, yeah, but, right? I mean, we do. We do. It's, it's like, yeah, God, I, I know that you've said that sex before marriage is wrong. I know your, your word says it's wrong. I know you've always said it was wrong, but I love him so much. He's the one. Or we're already engaged, so it doesn't really matter. Yes, it does. Because God said so. Because God said so. And it doesn't matter what your culture says. It doesn't matter what your culture believes. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing. It doesn't matter what social media says. It doesn't matter what anybody says, but God. Because he said so. I know I'm married. I know I made a commitment. I know you hate divorce. But, but you don't understand, God. This other man, this other woman, they make me feel accepted. They make me feel loved. And we argue with God. Oh, I, I know, God. I know you hate gossip. I know you detest it. Your word speaks against it so much. But, but you don't know what they did, and I've just got to tell somebody. Right? Oh, but I'll make sure to, to throw in there, let's pray about it, and then it'll cover it, and then, well, then it won't be gossip because we'll just, we're just sharing prayer requests. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? He tells Peter to go let you down your nets. We let down our nets even when it doesn't make sense. We do what God says, even when it doesn't make sense. We do it because God said so. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says he wants to move the boat and he wants to go out into the deep water. Why? Simple. <laughs> I could ask Tyler. Well, I'm not going to ask Tyler because he fishes for bass. This won't work. Okay. You only catch little fish in shallow water. Unless the bass are spawning and they happen to be up, right? right? Typically speaking, you only catch little fish in shallow water. You want to catch the big fish? You got to go to the deep water. And Jesus says, I want you to go out. And I want you to go out and drop in the deep water. But here's the problem with that. The deeper you go, the potential for risk increases. Because the deeper the water, the bigger the waves. The deeper the water, you can no longer touch if you happen to fall out of the boat. The deeper the water, you don't know what's underneath the surface, which can be really, really unnerving when you're fishing in a kayak on the ocean. And you can't see the bottom. And then your mind starts playing. I wonder if I look like a topwater plug floating out here. Because there are things in this ocean big enough to eat me whole, right? But moving into the deep water involves risk. It involves taking a chance. But here's the thing. Most people, though, they want to live their lives in the shallow waters. That's where it's safe. That's where the risk is manageable. That's where you can see the bottom. That's where you're not too far from shore. But as a result, not only are you in the shallow waters, your faith remains shallow as well. Your faith is not deep. When God works in your life, it always involves risk. Always. Why? Because he wants your faith in him, not in yourself. If you stay close to the shore, I can depend on myself. If I fall out, no big deal. I can stand up. I can walk. If I fall out, no big deal. The fish up here are little. They can't hurt me. You fall out three miles off the shore, guess what? You got a problem. Unless you're depending upon God. Too many people remain content to live in the shallows of their Christian walk, showing up just on Sunday mornings or whatever, not really involved in anything else. And, and if that describes you this morning, let me just say, you are missing out on so much more. And, and understand this, why? Listen, what would have happened to Peter if he'd have stayed in the shallows? He would have never caught that big catch of fish to the point where his boat was sinking. He'd have never caught it had he not ventured away. Sometimes we got to take a chance. Sometimes we got to take a risk. 
Why should we go with God's plan instead of ours? Simple. God's wisdom is greater than ours. God knows best. Again, God's ways don't compute with our ways. Go through your Bible. Go through your Bible. And, and you will see people over and over again faithfully believing and executing God's plan, even when that plan made absolutely no sense at all. Go watch the, go watch the children of Israel march around Jericho like a band playing trumpets. Right? And what happens? The walls fall down. Made absolutely no sense. Go, go watch Gideon and as, as, he, as he takes his men and he hones it down to a few. And then he takes them into battle. He takes them into battle with a torch and a trumpet and a bucket. And, and wins. And it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all for Moses to, to, to lead the people out of Egypt. It makes no sense. But guess what? God made it work. God made it work every single time, and he will in your life too. Get God in the boat, go with God's plan, and lastly, anticipate God's promises. Look at verse 5 through 6. Got to hurry. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, did you get that? catch that part? When they had done this, they acted it wasn't just acknowledgement of, yeah, I believe what you said. It, there was action that followed. Man, church, too many times we'll sit in here and we'll assent to everything God says. And we walk out that door and never act on it. At some point in time, the realities and the truth of God's word have to translate into action in our lives. If they don't, what's the point of all this? We come together to sit and listen because we check off a box to say we came and sat and listened. If it doesn't appropriate into action or movement in your life, it's worthless. It's worthless, other than to just make us feel good for, for, for doing our little bit of religiosity for the week. When they had done this, they acted. They, and they acted based upon, I believe, what Jesus had told them. Jesus didn't spell it out for them by saying, Peter, if you listen to me, do as I tell you. I promise you'll catch a lot of fish. He didn't need to say that. Because Peter understood once Jesus told him to go fishing and he got into the boat with him and told him where to put down the net, that that net wasn't coming up empty anymore. And let me tell you something, church. If you in your life, if you're going through something, if you're struggling with your marriage, if you're struggling with your kids, if you're struggling with your finances, if you're struggling with whatever, understand this. Appropriate yourself to the presence of Jesus. Listen to God's plan. Do God's plan. And then anticipate God's plan will work. Trust in it. Trust in it to work. That's exactly what happened. And you may be sitting there right now thinking, yeah, you know what? That sounds great. But you don't know my circumstances. And you're right. Maybe I don't. Because right now I'm, I'm defeated by my problems. My problems are bigger than me. And they're bigger than you. And they're bigger than some little feel-good sermon about catching fish. And that may be what's going through your mind right now. And you know what? They may be bigger than you. And they may be bigger than me. But let me ask you, are your problems bigger than God? And the answer is no. Emphatically no. Absolutely not. God is way bigger than any problem or past any of you have or that I have. And I think it's high time we as followers of Jesus Christ start living life based on the because you say so, God. That's all I need to know. Because you say so. I'll, I'll, I'll align my marriage the way you want me to align my marriage. Because you say so. I will parent my kids the way you want me to parent my kids. Because you say so. I will, I will worship because you say so. I will teach because you say so. I will evangelize because you say so. Everything I do, I will do because you say so. And that's enough. I don't need anything else. I don't need anything else. Let's wrap this up by looking at how Peter responds real quick. Luke chapter 5. Let's, we, I, gotta, I, can't, I can't leave it hanging there. So here we go. Starting in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he saw this huge catch of fish. When he saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees praying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Although I totally believe that Peter expected to catch fish when he did as Jesus asked, he had no 
way of anticipating the level of fish he was going to catch. There, there, were, there was no, it wasn't just a few fish that came up. It was a miraculous catch that no one could deny. It changed his life. And not only did it change his life, it changed everybody else's life who was involved as well. This morning, what do you do with failure? Get Jesus in your boat. Appropriate his presence into your life. Go with God's plan because he said so. Do what he asked because he said so. You want it to work? Kids, let me tell you something. I know y'all are growing up in a culture that I can't understand. Yes, I do know how to open a PDF. Okay? And I know the world is telling you, do this to be successful, do that to be successful, do this to be like, do this to be, you know, and, and they're inundated in you and you're getting it from all way. You're getting it on social media. You're getting it on the internet. You're getting it from TV. You're getting it everywhere. Everybody's got an opinion. I, we've talked about it before. You got all these people out there. They're called what? Influencers, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, oh, I follow this one and I follow that one. And I follow this one. And I follow that one. Why? Because you're, you're letting them talk to you about and influence you about what you're going to do, right? That's what an influencer does. Let me tell you, there's another influencer in your world and his name is Satan. And let me tell you something else. If he can talk angels out of heaven, he can talk you into hell. Think about that. Who's influencing you? Who's influencing you? What are you letting in? Go with God's plan if you want to be successful. And when I mean successful, God's definition of success, not the world's. You want God taking care of you. Follow his plan. And then as you follow it, anticipate and to decide, decide right now, I'm going to marry a godly man. I'm going to marry a godly woman. Decide today. That's my plan. And then anticipate God's fulfillment of that promise. Look forward to it. Pray about it. Look forward to it happening. And then when it happens, give glory to God. Anticipate God's fulfillment in your life. Parents, pray for your kids' success, not in money, but in marriage, in faith, in, in spirituality, pray for them to marry somebody who's going to get them to heaven. I tell you what, man, I got a slew of kids. I got one, I, 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 got, I got one request of anybody who gets, who gets in a relationship with them. And it's simply this. What are you going to do to get them to heaven? I don't care if you flip burgers at McDonald's for the rest of your life. If you get one of my kids to heaven, you're on, I'm on board with you. Parents, it's high time we got out of the materialism business and spent so much time making sure our little Johnnies and little Julies grow up to make boatloads of money. Instead, we need to make sure our little Johnnies and little Julies grow up to be faithful to God because that will never disappoint them and it will impact their lives, their jobs, their marriage, everything about them. How do we do that? You want to make sure you never fail as a parent? There you go. Get Jesus in your boat. Go with God's plan. Anticipate God's promises. And then sit back and watch God work. Today, giving you a lot. Hopefully a lot to think about. God does not want you to be a failure. God wants you to succeed. First and foremost, he wants you to succeed in your relationship with him. And today, if you're not in a relationship with him, he has paved the way for you to do that through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. And if today you're ready to, to stop failing at life and accept Jesus as your savior, we're ready to help you with that. But maybe today you just need the prayers of this body. Maybe you feel like a failure and you need to be reminded that you're not. That with God, all things are possible. That with God, you can do all things through his strength. Whatever you need, let us know as we stand and as we sing.